So appreciate, appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to, to be with you uh, th this afternoon and want to commend you for sticking through the end of the, s end of the conference. Um, one, of the, one of the audience members here is my wife, and I asked her this morning if she was going to attend this presentation. She said, no, you're the last session. Why would I attend the last session? But I appreciate but I appreciate her sticking it out too. So there's, there's, there's two objectives we'd like to have you feel like you accomplish uh, when, when you leave today. Uh, the first one is to, is to distinguish the difference between what we call good teaching, scholarly teaching, and the scholarship of teaching and learning. And then we also want to start to give you a kind of a roadmap to, on how you would know how your students are learning what you think they are learning. And to be able to document this in, 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 in a scholarship of teaching and learning project. Um, before we get into kind of the meat of the program, I just want to tell a little personal experience. So about uh, seven to eight years ago, we were at a regional conference uh, uh, and, and, and Eastern kind of a spring conference and Ray Coward was a provost at that time. And he, and he said something that stuck with me and it started to help me understand teaching in a different light. And as the provost, he was obviously on the Central Committee for Promotion and Tenure. And, and he, in, in his talk that uh, afternoon, he said something that uh, was very profound to me. He said, I would really, I have yet to see a dossier that comes through from a teaching faculty that says something like this. I learned this really cool idea from a journal, a colleague, uh, the internet, that I really thought would be a good teaching idea. That's part one. Part two, this is how I implemented it. And part three was, this is how I assessed if it impacted student learning. And when he said that, I started to say, well, that sounds very much like what we do in our discipline fields. It's, it's, the, it's the developing a hypothesis, asking a research question. And so from that, I started to kind of view our teaching in a different sense. So to give you a little background here, um, Boyer, in Scholarship Reconsidered in 1990, he articulated four different types of scholarship. The first one was integration. The second one was discovery. And traditionally, when we think of our roles in our dis discipline, that's what we are doing, is discovering new information. The science of application is about implementation. But this idea of teaching and elevating it in its own scholarship has become known as SOTL. The acronym SOTL stands for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. What is the difference between good teaching, scholarly teaching, and the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning? All of us are probably good teachers. We probably have this idea about how what we present works. When you see uh, students in your class and you can just tell that they get this idea, that they become passionate about this idea that you're trying to teach them. You're probably being a good teacher. Scholarly teaching, though, takes it to another level, a higher level, where you're not only doing what you think is good teaching, but you start to uh, be reflective about what you're doing. You start to think more about what you're doing. And you, you start to tie that into the bigger picture of the literature about what is known in, this, in your specific field of teaching or specific methodology, uh, methodology, methodology. And you look, you start to understand, and you start to explore pedagogy. Pedagogy is simply the art and the science of teaching. And so you start to do research in those areas. You start to become familiar with that. 
and you're always focused on student learning, but then to take it to this, higher, this highest level of scholarship is where you start to not only make improvements in your class because you, and it's informing you, you're starting to inform your field through conferences like this, through journal publications. Kim is the editor of our, of our local journal here. So anytime we share something like that, it is going to go and become this idea of scholarship. Another definition I really like is uh, Hutchings and Schulman 99, and I like the term up there, going meta. So you're thinking about your teaching. You're thinking about how are your students learning. You're thinking about why this worked, why that didn't work. And so that meta, that, that, that going meta, why did this work in this class but it didn't work in that other class? Last year when I taught this class on this section, my students were really engaged. What was different this, this year at Bond? Um, but you do so with an eye not only to improving your teaching, but to informing the field. James is going to now lead us in a discussion about some of these, about these three different. Hey, let's go back examples. to that slide. And I've got my, we're I, tight on time, Dave, so I'm going to start a timer for 10 minutes. And I don't want to talk for 10 minutes, I want to hear for 10 minutes. We have the two mics, the little blocks there. Think of these three categories. And again, Dave said something that was a probably good assumption that we're all good teachers. I don't know that that's always a great assumption across the system, but I think in this room you're here at 3.30, so probably. W name some of the things, either qualities of good teachers, pick any category, we don't have to go in order, or even traits or things, peers or yourself, that exemplify one of these three levels. So I'll start us off. I worked in the K through 12 world for 18 years and then higher ed for a number of years. You know, I saw teachers that had AP teachers that taught basically to the test, and their, te their students all did well. Passed the AP test, got credit. Good teaching, scholarly teaching, or scholarship of teaching and learning level? Good teaching. Now, we, it might actually also be reflective of some other levels of that. By the way, I've never said this to Dave. It wasn't a marketing person who came up with the term SOTL. I actually think, for whatever reason, it sounds like a medical procedure to me. So I think it's kind of a bad title. but. Let's go through some of the other categories. Name or identify through things you've seen scholarly teaching or good teaching, Kim. Well, and we can throw this or hand this. Well, I probably can shout. Okay. Oh, oh, we need it here. Just here you go. Sorry. I was just in another session and she asked us to write down uh, the best criticism we'd ever received as instructors and the worst criticism. And everyone in the room, for, took that as the best criticism they ever received and then told about something that was really painful uh, that was very critical of their teaching but that it, oh best and worst feedback sorry and but the best feedback they ever received was the harshest and then they took that and they talked about how it made them a better teacher and she said that's not where I wanted you to go with that but everyone in the room took that that those criticisms as positives so it hijacked hers but I think that goes to that second level, which is scholarly teaching, which is reflective. Like, okay, I had feedback. What did I do with the feedback? So that's, and then and doing something with that information. So that's a good example. Anything else? And remember, pick up the mic if you can. So go ahead. An example of good teaching is um, student engagement. Back when I taught uh, secondary science for a long time, I really focused on my relationship with my students. That mattered to me, and it still matters. You know, do I get along? Do we respect each other? I don't know that that fits in these last two, but it certainly, so there's not a hierarchy here that says the other two are better. It's not like we're dismissing good teaching as still, uh, it is foundational. It's still important. It still requires commitment and, and relationships and all of those things. So. But it's easy for us to come up with good teaching. Let's go to some of the other two. So Charlene, Dennis, anything you can think of that leads to scholarly teaching? What does it mean to have a reflective practice as a teacher? I think we all have people come in and observe us. And I think there, it can be in different levels. But that, that peer observation and then 
uh, a critical review with one another and looking forward to new practice. And I, I want to say this about promotion or tenure and, and the process of having others come in. You have a committee, you have a peer, you know, an academic peer who comes in. Do we do that because of the requirement or do we do that because of a desire to improve? And I think there's a different outcome for both of those. And, and the answer is yes. I think it's the motivation for what you're, why you're having that peer come in. And the motivation leads to where we are as, as educators or, or faculty members. Other thoughts? Uh, scaffolding is, is a hot topic and, and is good. But I think there's a, you have to reflect a little bit about it. What I think is important is do the students have the background they need to catch on the objective of the day? Just because they had a class last year and, and passed it doesn't mean they can remember the information and be able to make the connections necessary for them to learn the new concepts. And so we have to somehow identify, which, and some will, but some won't. And so somehow we have to follow through and, and help them make those connections with what they should have already learned with what they're learning today. So one of the things about, again, going back to the word reflective is then change. So reflective meaning that we're, it might be that we're perfect, but I don't think in this case any of us are, but then adjusting. Many, many years ago, I actually lived in France, uh, and so when I was teaching secondary science at some point, the woman who was the head of our school said, I want you to teach, we were a French school that taught in English, she said, I want you to teach science in French. And I thought, well, biology is a language all unto itself, and because I speak French as a second language barely fluently, to convert that to, uh, you know, the, the science of French biology. Same terms, same concepts. I said, I can't do it. Like, I, I really can't. She said, try. And I actually failed. But back to the idea of trying things and reflecting and improving, what I realized was, out of the process, I realized I was teaching biology in a rote, repetitive way that it kind of shook me up, and I realized it must be as boring to them as it was to me, and doing it in French challenged my brain a little bit, made me take it to another level. I actually think by becoming a reflective teacher, I actually was no longer good. I actually got worse, but then the process helped me get better. Scholarly teaching of, uh, and, and learning, the idea of presenting outward. One of the things that I think we often do, especially when it comes to promotion, tenure, or even reviews, is not think are we influencing and changing our discipline or our uh, collective body of teaching. I think today's a good example where we are doing that. But how do we do that without being presenters at conferences? How do we do that in a more informal way where we've elevated to that third level, we've gone through reflective kind of evaluation of our teaching, and then get that information out or change the way others teach as a body within a discipline? Um, I'm just thinking that sometimes I, I know I think that it needs to be something really huge and significant, like change the world practice that I invented or found, and really it doesn't, just our small little things that we find work in our class and then sharing that. Just, you know, even the things we're learning in here, most of them are just little, little bits and pieces that we can use to become better and then with that, that sharing with others. So, Cheryl, how do you share? What are some of the creative ways? How do I share? Um, probably mostly just interactions with peers, with talking with colleagues. And Your website? The website? Yeah, that you share circle time. And oh, well, I'm not thinking of that as tying into this. But yeah, trying to share professionally in whatever other ways possible, then that's I guess count as well, but I wasn't thinking that direction. So our department, you know, uh, all of the faculty at the Uinta Basin campus that I run, there's 27 faculty, but they're all in their own departments. They all report upward to their departments here in Logan. But it creates an environment where I have four biology faculty, four education faculty, one business faculty. In a weird way, it's positive because we have a number of faculty across disciplines, and so there's informal sharing at, you know, when some play basketball or some, I have a group that goes for walks in Vernal and they, they're talking informally. That's part of that scholarship of teaching and learning. 
and, and I'm going to use an example now because I have two minutes before our 10 minutes is up and it could come at the end. When I ran this private school, uh, I came up with this brilliant idea, and I say that somewhat tongue-in-cheek, that I would pay for master's degrees for teachers that wanted to go back because I wanted to elevate. I was doing my doctorate at the time, and I found it so engaging. So I thought, everyone's going to love this. I'll pay for their school. What I found out was that of my 50 faculty members, teachers, most didn't have the time or the energy or desire to go back to school. And, and so they didn't take up, but one or two did. And I created an environment where one or two were engaged on what I would say is testing theories or their specific uh, thesis or dissertation. And they were talking about it all the time, like we all do with our dissertations. And they made outliers in the group. So now I have two teachers that no one wants to talk to, uh, which is not a community of scholarly teaching and learning, but actually outliers that alienate the rest. So I had to come back with a different model uh, because paying for school and credits didn't work. And it was that we needed to create an environment where everyone had informal. And this is what I think SOTL is more like. Instead of saying, go back and get another degree and then pick one thing you're studying well, it's more nimble, more dynamic. Test for a month. Find an assessment. Dave's going to now move into that process of how do you test. And it's very much like the scientific method, very much like the you know, um, iterative process. But I think that's where people that have become educated get locked in re maybe even resisting this idea because we think it has to be, like you said, Charlene, big, grand, something that I can present at a conference and everyone says, I never thought about it. It might be more on a walk as a group, group of faculty members talking about switch, uh, flipping a classroom or even more basic than that. I tried to introduce this and it didn't go well. That might change someone else's behavior and it might not even be that the process didn't go well, it was the person. I mean, it's a, it's a much more nimble process, but Dave's gonna go through the five steps and talk about how those work. And, and uh, thanks, Dave. So, so we've, we've met, we've hopefully met the first objective, which was you know, understanding the difference between good teaching, scholarly teaching, and SOTL. This, the second step is we want to take you through these five steps and what does it look like to engage in a SOTL project? And we draw, we draw this content from this book. Oh, I have slides for you. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a one-page handout when we're done. And they're just in my folder, James. And it'll, so you'll have this information, this information with you. So these are, the, these are the five steps. Generating a research question. So I want you to think about in your own, and, and James, let's, let's shift up a little bit from our original plan. Let's make this more interactive right here. Generating a research question, designing the study, collecting the data, analyzing the data, and then presenting your project. So what's, so, so, so let's just go to the, to the research question. The goal of this, Step is to transform the hunches and ideas you've had into a research question. What's something you've wondered about in your, in your teaching? One, one thing I've wondered about is I've introduced in one of my online classes this idea of concept mapping. Concept mapping is where students take a bunch of concepts, they put them on a piece of paper, and they draw diagrams and name the relationships to the, to the different parts. I wondered, is that effective? Are students learning? What are some things you guys have wondered about in your teaching that you think you could make into a research question? Jim, go ahead. Oh, here. Um, I primarily teach concurrent enrollment. Uh, so every time the uh, new legislation, legislative budget comes up, I wonder seriously about the efficacy of, in, of concurrent. Are we, are we really helping them? And in what ways are we helping them? Okay. Can I say one thing yeah. that I've wondered? With the state now having concurrent enrollment available to freshmen and sophomores, and in the Uinta Basin where we have um, seven high schools. Some of them are more interested in actually opening that up and we've encouraged them not to, except in rare cases. But that's a question now I wonder, over the next two years will we see a different 
you know, we already have the data, that metadata coming in, not meta, but data coming in, which is are they passing at the same rate or do they get the same outcomes based on assessments with younger concurrent enrollment students? Question, just to make sure I understand, concurrent enrollment is enrollment both in college and high school. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, high school students taking classes for college credit while they're still in high school. Thanks for... So anybody have an idea in your own teaching, what's something you've wondered about? Please. When I give students two weeks to work on an assignment, why do they all wait three days before it's due to get started? Okay. Is there anything I can do to encourage them to get an earlier start? Okay. So, so how, how might you turn that into a research question? And maybe, maybe other people might be able to jump in and give suggestions. What is one activity, one intervention you can use and see if that has an effect? So, so, so it might be, I'm going to do this, it, I'm going to introduce this teaching method and see what its impact is on quality of this assignment. Would, would that fit? Okay. Uh, any, any other ideas about somebody over in this group? Something you've been wondering about in your own teaching? Any ideas? Please. Does offering a, a short quiz multiple choice questions uh, related to a reading that they're supposed to do before class. Do they actually read the paper or do they skim it? Uh, and how can you motivate them to actually read and critically think about the paper before? I heard several research questions for, 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 from that, right? Uh, and, and, and one might one, one might simply might be, you know, does introducing a short quiz uh, help with reading comprehension, so, so something along, along those lines. Shirlene, I know you're interested in studying this. What, 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 what's a research question you have related to gaming and engagement? Oh, well, we, um, we are trying to find out if implementing more gaming into our class uh, helps engagement. And so working on bringing more of that in, and everything from like Kahoot to um, finding different apps and simulations and, and things like that that our students can do. Jay, do you want to go to the next one? Designing a study. So this, this is probably <laughs> the hardest part of the SOTL project. And, and the reason this is the hardest is because this is usually where things start to break down because you have all these ideas about what being a good teacher is. I want to try this intervention. I'm going to introduce a short quiz. I'm going to introduce this game. But then you have to ask yourself this question. How am I going to measure what I'm doing and if, how am I going to be measuring student learning? Can I show a difference in student learning. And so I want to talk about student learning for just maybe a couple of minutes here. So, so let's, let's talk about traditional ways that we measure student learning. What, what, what's probably the most common in a class? So it's a final, right? So you, it's a final, it's a midterm. It's a, it, could, it could be a written test. Writ, written tests are certainly more difficult to grade, right, than a multiple choice quest, but you can still grade them and, and develop some kind of rubric where you assign them a score that, they, that, they, that reflects the quality of paper, right? What are some other ideas about measuring student Dave, I want to chime in. Yeah, please. I actually think sometimes, too, this is where people get to, you and I had a t talk at lunch about quantitative and qualitative, uh -huh. and. We, we often dismiss when we start to go down this road of the, um, the steps, the research design, even things in education, we teach to the test and passing now instead of satisfaction. You know, and I'm not saying, did you feel good about your failing grade? That's not what I mean about math. I just mean, are the students feeling themselves engaged in the class? Sometimes our questions aren't always about the outcome academically. They can be. I talked about relationships mattering to me at the beginning. I don't think we have to pendulum to the other side where they shouldn't matter. It's both. And, and so though sometimes the design can be quizzes not about the content, 
but short multiple choice quizzes about the class itself. How's the format working? You know, are you enjoying the process? What can we do differently? Please. You're making me think about different ways um, that we assess within our classrooms. Yes. You know, um, this idea of a multiple choice uh, five question quiz before yes. the, the class. Well, we can look at it from an academic standpoint. Did they understand what the reading was about? But then also, I think there's ways that we should look at does it influence the type and quality of discussion that is occurring within the class, which is a, it's a different outcome. And so I think we need to look at what outcomes we want to get. But, but, but do you know what I love about what you just said? We're being iter iterative here. Right, right now, this was a beautiful example of just us kind of having this conversation and, and you, you take it to this next level of not only is this interesting, but wow, what if instead I thought about it as, as this, 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 this pre-questionnaire or this pre, yeah, this pre-questionnaire, what, maybe we use it rather than, maybe we use it as the independent variable and we start thinking about class discussion as the dependent variable, the depth of the class discussion. That might become your research question. And then you have to ask yourself as you're thinking about that, well, how am I going to measure depth and quality of this discussion? There are ways, I'm, I'm guessing there's ways to do that, but you'd have to dig into the literature, right? And this is where I think it's really fun, where, where, where you go back now and you go into scholarly teaching and you get into the pedagogy of, of class discussions and, and depth and, and then what might be unknown is how to, how, how to, how to assess them. Charlene, so, so I'm gonna go back to uh, the design, uh, the, the design and she's, she's mentioning, you know, she mentioned gaming. One of the conversations we're having right now, we're looking at um, the dependent variable about student engagement just keeping it real simple, student engagement. And when we talk about design, you have to ask yourself, okay, how would I, I, I got the idea of how I want to collect data, but how am I going to compare it to something? You have to compare it to something. So can you talk, maybe, maybe can you speak to, we, we've talked about someday we'll measure gaming, and then what will we measure on other days? Well, we're gonna measure how much, well, just like an exit poll of how engaged did the students feel that day with class and compare a lecture-based class to a class that included a game. And with that type of response, we might be able to tell if huh. it's making you, a difference. You could, you could answer the, qu the research question, are students more engaged when, a gaming, uh, when gaming is implemented during, dur during that particular class. And I want to go back to Frank uh, Gailey's comment at, the key, uh, at our lunch. He said, keep it simple, right? He said, keep it simple. Th these ideas here we're talking about is kind of this big project, but you can also kind of make it narrow and, and, and really keep it simple. Dave, I, know I want to say Dave, one thing yes. about steps two and three. This is where I think that most who are well educated or specifically educated in one field is that every, to every hammer everything looks like a nail. This is where I think we have to break out of our traditional norms of how we gather data, how we analyze, and start looking at pedagogy and broader than maybe, if I'm a physicist, you know, the hard sciences and, and break that. And that's where I think it comes back to help us because then we're growing. Instead of being good at what we do, we're becoming better at what we may not do well. And that might be broadening out how we look at teaching or even research itself uh, from a process of growing, so, yeah. So step three, how, how are you gonna collect the data? Step four, James, Yep. you wanna, yep. can you explain that four? It's simply analyzing the data. I mean, if, if, Shirlene, and, if Shirlene ends up carrying this project out, she's gonna have some, some numbers that are going to represent a mean between the time she uses a gaming in class versus the day she doesn't, she's simply going to analyze that with, uh, with a t-test. And so the same statistical procedures that you do in your discipline research are going to apply in, in, in this. And as we've, as Shirlene and I have gotten into this, 
we're starting to recognize that just like our discipline, we, just this past week on Monday, actually, we were, we were we have a committee of folks that are working with us on this, and we started to look at these learning assessments, and some of them have been validated, and they meet the psychometrics of validation, and so just like your discipline research, this can go deep. Step five is simply uh, publishing and letting people know. And so we just got maybe two or three minutes left, James. I want you to kind of, what, what, what are your thoughts? How would you? Um, well, I want to go back to that comment please. I made earlier about um, the idea that having one person do something doesn't create an environment, it has to be a community. And I've worked uh, both in Colorado here and in Wyoming and Montana in small, smaller educational settings, currently for a larger institution. But there has to be a group. There has to be a committee, or a committee sounds too formal, uh, a grassroots group of people that want to talk. And, and it might be something where over time, and I find that these kinds of projects, the more formal they become, the less effective they become. So I also think when you're thinking of the outcome of publication, it actually almost gets in the way of the process. So I think that publication can be a byproduct. Think of sharing more than publication. Think of talking, kind of in an evangelical, going out and talking about something you've learned. That's where the energy starts to uh, you know, inspire others to teach better. And then publications, I think, they do certainly come out of this. What I actually think most often comes out is larger publications. So the accumulation of an idea and coalescing of other ideas into what might be a larger kind of educational change initiative that can be studied and, and then brought to, the, to the, the field. Please, Dennis. I think most of the time when I go through this, it's not so much the presenting and publishing, it's just that, oh, here's some more questions I have to answer. Uh, it's, it's, here's the next step, here's another question, is this gonna be better, whatever, so. I, th I think it keeps us working hard at it. And, and Dennis, I think your, your, your comment leads into a great point about, you know, why, why do we do this? I mean, there's external reasons like promotion and tenure to do that. But I think Dennis hit on a really important internal reason. It keeps us engaged. You know, it, ke it keeps us young, so to speak. It keeps us motivated. And I, and I really like that kind of lifelong learning mentality and growth mentality of, Always, always learning, always asking these research questions. And then, as James said, when you can get a community like that that's also engaged, it's a really rich environment to be a part of. And I want to commend USU. I've told James at lunch, you know, I've been here about 20 years, and, and I've slowly seen teaching just becoming more and more ele elevated. And I think it started with, with Ray Coward probably about... 10, 12 years ago when he started to do these excellent teaching and workshops and provided this, this training. And there was always this question of, is teaching really valued as much maybe as research? And I, I, I think more and more at USU, it is, it, is, it is valued. And I think those that have gone through the process of promotion and tenure can hang their hat on that with confidence. And we just work at a great institution. and. It's just a great time to Can I say one more thing, Dave, engaged? about back to that private school I, I ran with 50 faculty. I was new. The average length of tenure, and I don't mean tenure in our sense, I mean length of time, was like 28, 29 years. And so I was getting teacher burnout, which actually is well beyond, I mean, 28, 29 years is well beyond that. My, my initiation was trying to keep them engaged. What I found was it really did. And so that's a byproduct of this is engagement and avoiding burnout, because then it's fun again to be a teacher instead of teach, and in the, that setting where many of them were teaching secondary subjects over and over and over seven periods a day, this makes it, like you were saying, Charlene, more game-like. But I do think that uh, Utah State is embracing and supporting quality education. And the idea of here being able to be make mistakes, try, find out the data is bad, back to my junior high science students, I would say science, is, no answers to science questions are more valid often than yes answers, meaning we know something doesn't work, that can influence how we get better. So, well, thanks. thank you. We appreciate your participation. We know it's the last session of the day, but thanks for, thanks for being here and, 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 uh, and for your engagement in this conversation today.